A lot of people are surprised when they hear that plastic is an organic material. And the reason why it's an organic material is because it's made out of carbons, just like living things. And plastic is an important resource for many industries. And this module 5 is about that. It's about the planning of resources needed for production. So, what you will learn in this module 5 is first you're going to get exposed to what MRP and ERP is all about. MRP is an acronym that stands for Materials Resource Planning. And ERP is, let's say, similar, except that the E stands for Enterprise. So it goes beyond materials. It goes to other type of resources, like, for example, people, but some others. So M ERP is an extension, a more holistic solution or approach. We're going to nevertheless dive more into the MRP system by identifying the main inputs and also the outputs that this system creates. Keep in mind, MRP is basically an algorithm. It calculates requirements of materials. Therefore, for goal number three, we're going to explain the logic of how this algorithm works. It's nothing complicated, it's just that it's time consuming and therefore we rely on, well, computer systems to do that job. But we're going to have a look at some simple examples. So let us start. And let us start with the concept of resource planning. So it's basically a process. Remember, a process consists of activities um, which are performed based on inputs and eventually they deliver outputs. In this case, the inputs are information plans derived from sales and operations. So what are, how many items of product X are we going to sell or is expected to be sold by the next three months? And based on that information and based on the information of how the operation runs, think about time needed to create, to produce a product, etc., etc. this system will create orders yeah, in, ter in terms of time standards, routings, uh, items that need to be procured or manufactured inside of the factory. And this is basically the output. So these are the plans for these input requirements. Okay, so the typical ERP system consists of all sort of modules. Here uh, you can see core functions and extended functions. If we just have a, a closer look and just sample a little bit of what is going on, you would recognize more acronyms like quality management or human resources. You also recognize modules like purchasing or e-procurement, demand planning or sales. And of course you have all sort of extensions. And here is by the way our CRM. So ERP systems in the market exist as modules. So you have a platform and then based on the needs of a particular business, we can attach the modules as needed and of course that our also budget allows. Um, also important to say is that a lot of how a lot of the way these uh, modules, these systems work, are based on certain standards, right? For example, if you're dealing with sales, and this is just a quick example, there is always a question of when do you recognize sales? In the moment a product arrives to your customer, or in the moment the payment of that product arrives to your company. It's a simple question, but it has a big impact because you might have a sales force that might earn based on bonus, on a bonus system, right? So whether you go for the first option or the second will definitely have an impact on his bonus. So this is just to highlight a bit of the ERP systems. Now, obviously there are tons of uh, providers, solutions providers and, and best practices attached to those solutions, but I can just show you Two of the most important ones, SAP, which by the way is, is a German uh, product. I think the, the founders were ex-engineers from IBM uh, with headquarters in Frankfurt, if I believe. And then of course you have Oracle. And here we can see a contrast between the modules that they provide and a description. So at the end, they do provide a lot of similar functions. It's just that they cluster them a bit different. So Oracle, might have a module called manufacturing where SAP has a PP and QM type of model. So quality management, quality management and 
production planning, for example, as separate models. Um, same with finance and controlling, where in Oracle it just simply cluster everything as financials. So here you have full detail of uh, descriptions of these modules. Important for you to know is that they more or less offer the same, except that it comes in a different package. Okay, so uh, what is the, let's just have a closer look about how the market uh, works. So the, the ERP modules, at least in the US, have different levels of demand. And it has to do with the nature of the activities that happen within the business function. So if you, if you take, for example, this, all financial models tend to be relatively easy to implement. And therefore, at least in the US, 91.5% of the business that buy SAP models, they buy it on financial accounting and controlling activities. It's very systematic. In fact, I remember I read once on The Economist that in some years, there is a 95% of probability that all these activities performed nowadays by accountants will be completely absorbed by AI. Yeah, so if you want, if you're planning to become an accountant, well, you just have to be aware of what is coming. Um, again, materials management, same story, very systematic, very predictable type of processes. But in the moment we move forward into activities like HR, then it becomes a little bit more complex, and therefore the applications are a little bit less common. That, by the way. That is research and development management. It's, uh, I mean, if you're familiar with innovation management processes, well, you might understand why is the, the acquisition is so low. Uh, it's 30, 31%, basically. So here, it gives you a contrast. Not every module is equally demanded. And it has to do with this, with the systematization of the functions that happen within the module. Going more in, in depth with MRP, which is again, is a, an algorithm, computerized information. Um, we see that there is a lot of diversity in terms of providers. So we have, of course, I show you Oracle, SAP. There are more, Epicor, NetSuite, uh, sometimes very specialized on particular industries because even just in the realm of manufacturing, you have high volume, highly standardized type of manufacturing. Remember made to stock. Uh, but then you move into make to order or engineer to order and these type of operations or processes have different type of needs and because of that you have a specific packages made or tailor made to those needs so in essence MRP is designed to answer three main questions number one is what is needed what in terms of resources which resource, which, re, which raw material, which subassembly, how much is needed, uh, take into consideration that your company, your factory might have a warehouse, right? So you have a gross requirement for a particular product that will consume some of these resources. So before you trigger an order to your supplier, you have to sort of deduct what you're having already in your in-house in your factory so this type of calculations happens here by the MRP it takes consideration of the inventory records then the last question is when is needed we don't want to procure materials way before they are needed because we will have to store them and that costs money this space people etc um, same with uh, work in progress. Those sub-assemblies in the factory, we don't want to produce more than what they're needed. In fact, what we want to have is more like a just-in-time kind of system. So things have to be procured or manufactured or fabricated in the moment when it's needed. And in order to define that moment, we need to have clarity of the lead time it takes to receive that item from our supplier to our doors or the lead time that it takes that for that item to be produced 
So lead time is one of those variables that will be taken into consideration by this algorithm. Okay, so let us start how this, the, the rationality behind MRP system. And perhaps you have heard that when we, whenever we are talking about demand, we can categorize it by independent demand and dependent demand where independent demand refers to the demand of finished goods. These are the demand of these goods are governed by the market forces. So this is really what the dealers are having on the shop floor or retailers, wherever dependent demand refers to the demand for the items that are subassemblies or components, parts used in the production of these finished goods. So if the sales forecast dictates that for next month, we're planning to sell 100 bicycles, well, you can more or less run the calculation in your head that we will need not 100 wheels, but 200 wheels. Why? Because it's a bicycle, so two wheels per bike. So we just do the multiplication and we can apply the same calculation for the rest of the parts. So you can already imagine that we will need a recipe as part of input information per item. And we talked about that before. If you have seen these modules, we talked already about the bill of materials. That is the recipe. Okay, so just to understand demand, I have created this very nice animation. Suppose this is your factory, right? And this is our finished goods, which are demanded by the market. So the demand of bicycles is largely covered by random factors because we don't know how the market will behave, but we know how the demand of components will behave because it's directly linked. It's just a calculation. So demand for components is governed by the number of bicycles planned to be made. I hope you enjoy my animation, by the way. Okay, so here comes an interesting thing. On the right side, we have the let's say the realm, the universe of finished goods. And you see here a timeline here expressing days. And here we have quantities of bicycles, right? So how can we interpret this line? That is the demand rate, number of units per time. And sometimes in books, you might find it as a straight line. And that is also okay, but in real, world that would mean that demand is highly not highly completely predictable as a straight line and in this case the line is a little bit not that straight it kind of fluctuates because that resembles perhaps more market forces here we have a red line that is a reorder point that means when items the number of items reach to that level that is the moment in which we have to trigger a demand for the fabrication of more bicycles. And, reg and of course, the demand of the, our finished goods will cross that, it, will, it can go all the way to zero, but we want to prevent reaching to that level. Because in the moment it reaches, like in this case, it didn't even reach, and we got the instantaneous replenishment. I mean, the, 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 the extreme would be that this demand line would hit rock bottom. And that is all fine but it's very risky. And then we will get the, synchro the synchron synchronization, sorry, I don't know what's happening to me with my tongue, the synchronization of arrival of items, of finished goods, and then we will have the straight line going up here. In this case, uh, we still have some buffer. It's a buffer stock of finished goods. And then we go up, all, up to a certain level, and the story repeats again and again. Now. If that is the universe of the finished goods, the universe of components will look very different. Okay. So how does it look? Is it looks, as they call it, sporadic or lumpy. That means we have sudden consumption of components. So if we go more into the details, that means that on day three, we reached to the reorder point, and then automatically there was an order trigger in this moment for 1,000 
bicycles. So, because we need 1,000 bicycles, we will need how many wheels? That's right, 2,000 wheels. So suddenly on day three, which is this moment, there is the pulling of these components as to be, let's say, assembled in that finished good. And the wheels, the uh, saddle, and the rest of the components will be, is the same story. They, all these components will be pulled as to create those 1,000 bikes, and it will take this lead time for those components to be ready and to arrive. So they will arrive on day five. So they trigger the order on day three, the components get pulled in these levels, you see the connection here, and then it, there is a lead time of three days, sorry, two days in this example, and then on day five, full replenishment. And the story will repeat again, this time on day eight. And this is day eight. And then again, it repeats. So you have to imagine a warehouse that is loaded with components. And that is all fine because um, inventory has the function of a buffering demand. But it's always a question of how much is too much. We don't want to have just a lot of components just waiting there to be consumed. Because, you know, it's, it, not only cost money, as we discussed before, but sometimes they get damaged or obsolete. So we have to find that sweet spot, as they say. So the MRP helps a lot in that. We will see how it works in a second. So once again, MRP uh, can be seen as just as an element from a bigger system. And this is just the big overview of all the decisions taken in a company from the long range of time, the medium and the short. So if in the long range uh, decisions have to be taken about products like, I don't know, like Apple, that once upon a time it was called Apple Computer, and suddenly this company decided to go into making smartphones or cellular phones as they were called back then, so that was a big decision to be taken and, and you stick to that decision for not just for some days or for the next year, you really stick to it. I mean, it's a strategic decision for the next years. Therefore, further decisions as whether we have the capacity to produce, the know-how, the resources will follow. All this happens in a low range. Eventually, we will reach to the level of creating a demand forecast like how many of these iPhones we are expecting to sell and you know we don't want to elaborate about how many iPhones I don't know seven and nines and tens and X we want to produce we just make the forecast on an aggregate manner as how many phones how many bicycles so this is what is called aggregate plan for production right Eventually, we're going to disaggregate and to really create the plans exclusively for every particular SKU or, or unit or product that we have. And this is happening here at the master production schedule because the output, if the aggregate plan derived from inputs like demand forecast functions as the input for the MRP, the output will be a highly detailed work schedule. What needs to be produced when? As if the following week on Monday from 8 to 10, we're going to produce road bikes. And then we're going to stop, do the proper setup, and maybe we're going to produce mountain bikes. And maybe this is, I don't know, Specialized or Cannondale or one of those famous companies. So this is one of the outputs, this type of orders derived from the MRP system. So here you can see how everything is connected, but of course on different time frames or time ranges. Okay, so let's just go more to the MRP. So on the left we have the inputs and on the right we have the outputs. So inputs, three. Number one, the master production schedule. Number two, the inventory record. And number three, the bill of materials, the recipe to construct an item, which by the way, also has its own inputs like design changes. Remember, like if you think about, I don't know, cars, you know that very often you have these facelifts as 
you know, there is the Audi A4 and, and it's been launched in, I don't know, I think the most recent version, which is called B9. It was launched um, in 2017, I, I think, or 2018, could that be? 17 or 18. And by now there is a new A4, but it's not really new, it's more like a facelift. So there are changes in the design and this might affect the bill of material. So that's why we have it here. And then the outputs, we have all sort of documents. That's why the shape of these boxes, we have orders, uh, purchase orders, or some kind of material planning reports. Okay, so let's go one by one, just very quickly. A master production schedule is also known as MPS. It tells you how much finished product is desired, but also when. So this is the disaggregation part. Remember that we created an aggregate production line derived from our sales forecast. Well, uh, now is the time to decompose those bulk numbers. So if that would be the factory for chairs, well, 670 chairs will be transformed into 150 ladder back chairs that are needed by the first week of April, 120 needed for the last week of April, and then in between we will need 200 and 200 for desk chairs. And that is April and May, although has the same volume, might look different. And the reason why it might look different, it has to do with the constraint of resources because the, 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 the workstations needed to create these products are the same. They have to be shared. So there is a lot of planning behind. So, so here, this is an input for the MRP. We provide that. We also want to provide inventory records. So here are some basic concepts. First, gross requirements. Gross requirements are the total number of expected items or the expected demand. And that is with regards to the amount that we already have on hand. As if next month we need to sell 670 chairs, which by the way, there will be these 150 of this type, etc. All these require materials. And many of these materials we are already having on our stock. That is what we call on hand. Yeah. But at this moment, we don't care. We just have the gross requirements. These are the numbers that we need. We also need to consider what is in the pipeline to be that is arriving. The so-called schedule receipts. So these are the open orders, the orders that we already triggered in the past. And they are in the pipeline inside of trucks in the highway and they are about to arrive to our facilities. That is a stock that we have. We don't have it on hand, but we have it on the street, literally speaking, or on top of the sea inside of a container. So this goes to this equation so that we can calculate the so-called projected on hand, right? Which is, let me just read this, the expected amount of inventory that will be on hand at the beginning of each time period, the schedule receipts plus available inventory from last period. So if, if today we are in the month of, what is today, March, well, at least now as I am recording is March, maybe in February we had 100 items, right? And, but we have 50 more arriving by the end of this month, yeah? So by the end of this month, we're going to have the 100 plus the 50, 150. And that is a good starting point as to this, the, this calculate or decide whether we have enough materials for the next period, you see? So this is what it means projected on hand. We are projecting what we are going to have really on our hands as stock. Okay, so this, this all these, what I explained, these are part of the inventory records that are integrated in the system. Of course, we have to provide the system with an input with the recipe that we talk about, the bill of materials. And just to go a bit further, well, there is a particular language. Um, you, we always talk about parents, and parents are like the, really the finished goods at the end. And we also have children, and the children are the subassemblies or the items that need to be procured or fabricated. Now, there are different ways to express this recipe. So here on top, we have what is known as assembly diagram. And here on the bottom, we have a product strict, a product structure tree. So assembly diagram, well, this is um, nothing but 
well, it's very schematic, really visual. You see really the components. And the product structure is just the same logic. We only just omit the drawings. But it gives you an idea of um, which items are needed, but also the quantities that are needed. So here we can visualize maybe two front legs. Here we can actually see legs. And then in parentheses, the number two. And you see some components, they have even three, like back support. One, two, three, back support, that's these three. And some components, there is no mention because it's just one. So you see, it's exactly the same information. Okay, so if we have this recipe, and if we have the gross requirements already known by a certain period of time, what the MRP is doing is the so-called MRP explosion. And this is what I'm going to illustrate here. So MRP explosion is a process, right? And it's basically a calculation. And it looks like this. So picture one, two, three, four, all the way to 10 as wicks. And imagine that we have a gross requirement of certain amount of items by week 10. And, you know, maybe these are bicycles. So for some reason, we need two weeks to finish this final assembly of a certain amount of bicycles. So this line represents the lead time, and that's the final assembly. Now, because it's a final assembly, it relies on subassemblies, and we have A and B in this case. You also notice here uh, time frames because uh, subassembly B only requires one week, and it can arrive also a little bit later than subassembly A. So according to our production route, we don't really need to have a subassembly B arriving at this time. We can wait until week eight and have it here. So why rushing up? Why consuming resources if we already, if we can wait? But it's not the same for a subassembly B. So, sorry, subassembly A. To continue with the story, subassembly A require parts. That would be part E and part C. Part E gets fabricated in-house. Part C needs to be acquired or procured by suppliers. And the story continues to the next level because fabricating part E requires also the procurement of raw materials, D and F, and subassembly B, by the way, requires the procurement of parts called age. And once again, you see here, these lines, they all represent lead times to either fabricate or to procure. So long story short, you end up with a diagram that looks like this, and it's kind of a tree diagram. It, of course, resembles the bill of materials, but now with a dimension of time. And this is already very useful because it can answer questions of, are we on time in delivering that product that is expected by a particular time, like in this case, week 10? Because let us assume that we have a delay somewhere here in this process. Well, you can already tell that unless some unusual measures are taken, like outsourcing production or working extra shifts, that goal won't be met. So that could already be very wise to know. It's also wise to know the timing of when items need to be fabricated or procured. You don't want to procure items or fabricate things way before they are needed. You want to do it in the time that are needed based on the lead times which are needed and everything pulled by the gross requirement which is time and quantity so it's very logic when you think about it it makes completely sense it's a backwards planning in other words backwards planning process that's what mrp explosion is all about okay so why don't we just practice uh, this algorithm uh, performed by a computer of course you have to picture that you know, in a factory, you don't have just one item, you have many items and many components and, and things are way more complex. That's why we need computers. But let's just get a feeling of how this works. And, and this is an exercise. How many units of A should be purchased? And we have to refer to this picture. This is the bill of materials. You see, you see the dependencies here, the parent and the children and the grandchildren and even a great grandchildren is even here. So we have different levels. How many units of items G, items E, 
and D, so this is D, and E must be purchased to produce five units of A. Mm -hmm. So how would you approach this? For example, if I tell you that we need 10 items of A, how many items of C do you need? And you would say, well, here there's a direct connection, so there's a dependency. And you might say, number one, well, you told me that number one indicates the number of items as to produce one item of A. So I would say, if 10 are needed, and assuming that we have nothing on our stock, we need 10. It's a one-to-one -one relationship. And I would tell you, you're absolutely right, it's 10. Now, what about B? Do we need 10? No, you would say. Of course not, because we have a three-to-one relationship. Aha, so how many do we need? And then you would say, well, it's at three times the A, so that will make it 30. Okay, so you see, you already knew how to do this. It's very logic. So if I'm asking, or this exercise is asking us, how many of items E are needed, what kind of calculations will you run? You can already practice this on your notebook if you have in a notebook or a paper next to you. Or even just you can grab your hand, uh, your smartphone. It has a uh, calculator function in case you don't know. I'm sure you have it there. So you can say, well, look, if I need 10, no, let's stick to the, to the case here, um, five. So if we need five, we need 15 B, 15 of B. But for every B component, we need two components of E. That means, under the assumption that we have nothing on our stock, we will need two times the 15. That makes it 30 components of E. 30 components of E are needed to create one component of A. You see? And this same logic I expect you to apply when calculating D. You see here the 1 to 3, the 3 to 1 relationship. But D is interesting because this is a component that is also chair for another subassembly. So you need to calculate 5 times 3 times 1 plus 5 times 1 times 5. No, sorry, times 1. So that will be... Let me just run it in my head. 5 times 3, that's 15. Times 1, that's 15. Plus 5, that's 20. I'm ho I hope that I did it right. It should be 20. We will check with the answers because they follow now. And then we can do the same for G. We need 5, 5, 5, 5. That was pretty easy. We need 5 components of G because of the direct relationship. So... This is a simple calculation. Of course, it can get more complex in the moment that we add additional variables like, for example, this, the number of units that we have on stock because we then have to deduct that amount. And it can also get more messy because in the, in the real world, we don't buy by units, we buy by lot sizes. So maybe you need two units, but then you have to buy 10 because your supplier sells only 10. So. So then that means that will affect your inventory records and that will affect, you know, like the, the final amount of items you will need. And if you run this system through time, then it gets more and more messy. You might end up with b bulks of uh, resources, raw materials that you just don't need. And I mean, I know personally a lot of horror stories around stock management, but we don't go there. We just want to understand the rationality of the algorithm. So. Let us check if, uh, if, if we were right. So this is, this is the solution to our, to our exercise. This is our 30. I, I still remember I say 30. And that's our 15. Plus a 5. That's 20 units for D. And G, it was pretty easy. It was a one-to-one -one relationship. That's the reason why it's 5. So I think I was right. And I think you were also right. So... Well, that's how it works. That's what MRP is doing. And guess what? Companies pay quite a lot of money for these kind of uh, calculations. Uh, I know cases that projects of SAP that they cost like half a million dollars 
and that is because of the consultants that you need to, to, to program the, I think it's called a BAP, the, the software uh, to create the transactions that you need to have in your, for the, your particular needs. Okay, so, so what are the benefits of these systems? Why do companies pay so much money? Well, first of all, it creates visibility. So the whole idea is that under the assumption that you have operation, operational discipline, that means that people are doing what they're supposed to do, registering the, the stock in the proper way, etc. So the numbers are correct. You will have a really a picture of what is happening in your factory on real time. Now, you will also develop or your business will develop a discipline of having a business process view because then you will see how information is flowing and is being transformed. That gives you that visibility, that business process perspective gives you a sense of control. You know? Because and then you can analyze, you can improve further your, your business processes. Uh, you also have a better way of communication. Eh? No more, you know, exchange of emails back and forth with Excel sheet, Excel spreadsheets, but rather reports highly standardized and also shared among participants, those who have access to those reports. So you standardize, no more confusion in that sense. And the beauty of all this is that it can integrate other ERP systems from your suppliers, from your customers. And these systems, as we discussed previously, they communicate. And then you have all this flow of information uh, happening 24-7. So this is, uh, this, this is just among many of the benefits of ERP. Okay, so MRP, ERP, these are nothing but just computer systems, packages, but I think it was worthwhile to just have an idea how these applications work and what kind of rationality they, they use. We just explore the bill of materials calculation based on requirements. I hope you, you got something out of it. There is an assignment. You have to build a bill of materials uh, by watching a video. I hope you manage to do that and you will get a better feeling of what it takes to do it. Thank you very much.